This presentation goes through my Brain O2 workout. The goal is to explain the difference of what, what adaptive contrast really does and to show you some results, both in terms of real-time um, brain energy as well as uh, results with other people. So we do what we call our Brain O2 protocol. Uh, the elements of the protocol are high-level exertion, high-level or high-intensity interval training, um, main element of the protocol is that you have to work out hard enough either by exertion or by hypoxia to be able to hear the heartbeat in the head. The purpose of this is by challenging the body. When you hear the heartbeat in the head, the body approximately quadruples. That's four times more blood squirting to and through the brain than normal. Okay, so that's why it's a high intensity workout. Uh, you know you're there when you hear your heartbeat in your head. Um, we also do mostly hypoxic, meaning most time on minus O2 with very brief 10 second or so exposures to oxygen. Um, because once you get to the point where you've got that blood flow circuit active, you don't want to stop it because it's so much discomfort and work to reach the uh, blood flow concentration of the brain. Uh, normal duration of the workout was 15 to 30 minutes. I think this one was about 18 to 20 minutes. So. In order to do the protocol, we used uh, LIVO2 with standard adaptive contrast. Uh, it has a hypoxic max of about 14 to 16 uh, percent simulated altitude, about 11,000 feet, which uh, for the uninitiated is about the same as aircraft cabin pressure in a commercial airliner. Uh, when you switch to O2, it's a concentration of 85 percent, while normal air is 21 percent, so it's roughly four atmospheres worth of oxygen. But in this case, it's important to point out that the hypoxia is a critical element because that's what enables the body to establish this uh, maximum blood flow to and through the brain. So we also used a portalite sensor by Artinus. You can see a picture of that on the right. Basically, it's uh, two light emitting assemblies that shine a light through the skull into the actual brain and it measures oxygen and deoxygenation of the blood meaning the difference between oxygen and deoxygen tells how much oxygen the brain actually used um, so that gives you a real picture of how much oxygen the brain's using during the workout and basically a real-time image or view of how much energy is getting produced in the brain during the workout so key points, number one, critical adaptive contrast mechanism, real-time brain oxygen metabolism. It shows hypoxic and hyperoxic uh, episodes during the workout. Um, we watch for higher highs, lower lo higher lows, meaning the whole picture of brain oxygen use goes up through the workout. Uh, when we get to the end, you'll see a steady state increase in brain energy production or brain oxygen use of about 29 percent. Um, the neurological performance boost will last for hours. Um, we also had the special opportunity to or narrate what's actually happening in the oxygen use of the brain when we go through the process we call beasting, which is an energetic euphoria um, that athletes experience. Um, but basically we'll show super oxygenated brain even on low oxygen air and I guess I describe this as athletic ecstasy. Okay, so this picture is basically the workout. The drops are hypoxic. The rises are periods of recovery on hyperoxic. So as we go through this, there's a whole series. I think I did a total of maybe a dozen hypoxic. But to take a look at the first hypoxic event, uh, you'll notice that the PO2 in the brain drops by approximately 20% from peak. Um, and then uh, my first hypoxic episode, I recovered in approximately 15 seconds on plus O2 before I was ready to continue. The second window was basically the second and third hypoxic events. Uh, same kind of pattern. Um, PO2 dropped by about 20% off each time and then recovered in 15 sec 10 to 15 seconds. But what's interesting here is that if we take a look between the first hypoxic recovery and the third, there's approximately a 15% increase in the brain just by the time I did the effectively third uh, recovery. Okay, the next four were basically the same picture. 
um, high pet epoxy again, four, five, and six. Uh, PO2 drops by approximately 30%, meaning the 15 all the way down to minus 20, maybe that's even 35. So as I went through, the amount of desaturation my brain went through was greater and the uh, swing between high, high highs and low lows increased. Um, I was able to recover in, I don't know, five to 10 seconds, meaning that the recovery periods were shorter uh, than they were in the earlier episodes, except for the last one. And then each peak as we go through this increased by two to three percent. So kind of in the middle of the protocol, progress was slow. The, the next section of the workout is what we call beasting. Um, basically, I started the um, sprint at the peak of this interval we can see the normal drop but what's special about this particular one is that I did not switch to oxygen for recovery so this reoxygenation or brain oxygen utilization event which actually showed higher oxygenation level was all on low oxygen so and we call this beasting or um, athletic euphoria what happened was that the brain oxygen energy production peaks even though you're on hypoxic air mixture. Um, what happens is you feel like a monster, like, ah, I'm going to go, 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 ah, and it goes on for a long time. So this experience lasted probably a minute and a half or two minutes as I was going through. Um, and I guess the best way to describe it is energetic euphoria. It's common with top tier athletes. I do not claim to be a top tier athlete, but um, it really is fun when it happens you know you know it when you see it and it's wonderful um, we've seen this with uh, a number of athletes we've trained Derek Torres uh, some sprinters and so forth so anyway it's uh, it's like it's really cool last part of the workout was basically a finish up but what was interesting here is you know after I finished the beasting uh, you'll notice that we went from 25 down to minus 5 so approximately 30 percent desaturation followed by very rapid reoxygenation and then the tendency of the brain more or less to hold on to the ability to uh, create energy um, continued and it took a long more of a challenge in order to bring the PO2 or the brain oxygen level down so this is through a hypoxic event number 8 to 12 the other thing you'll notice is the total I'll call it energy produced in the brain increased and so for whatever reason you know the brain ends up producing more energy such that by the sprints near the end the brain is just locked on and able to make energy or use oxygen almost regardless of PO2 level in in, in the respiratory air anyway so the point was that you know this pro progresses to what I'll call a durable maximum so that once you finish the protocol you feel great and you don't even notice that you're breathing you know lower quantity air uh, at the end you just feel bright and good so if we take a look at the I'll call it physio durable physiology that occurs if we take a look drawing a line through the higher highs you know the the protocol eventually converges on a steady state which is you know back to hypoxic or room air and that the differential in terms of brain energy production between the beginning and end is in, an increase of about 29 percent so um, anyway and like I say this lasts for hours after you finish so if you're preparing to work out or compete you know having your brain starting at out of starting out in this zone of being super oxygenated and super efficient with oxygen is obviously a performance advantage so <laughs> the next question is like wow okay what does that this actually do for neurological performance so since I'm the first crash test dummy um, basically we did this before and after uh, and I measured or these tests show roughly a 12% increase in neurocognitive index this is using CNSVS which is the same neurological panel that the Navy SEALs use pre and post deployment to measure for determine if they've lost brain function as a result of a field injury so if we take a look at the first signal or first test uh, low low average average the following test was conducted literally or roughly the next day and you'll see that all of my scores moved to the left meaning average went to either average or above and that I had no scores in the lower average or low so using the sort of aggregate score of uh, the neurocognitive index I went from a 92 to a 103 which amounts to roughly 12 percent overall improvement in neurological performance so given 
this was interesting. I thought it would be great to go ahead and start testing this protocol on other people. What we discovered is a lot of the athletes that had had uh, concussions, they automatically went into this aggressive training mode. So this is a first case, sort of a discovery case, 50-year-old, 58-year-old female. And what's interesting was this is her first workout. She did her first workout at just after 11 o'clock in the morning, and she took, and each one of these red scores basically is a below average or low score, as in usually the first percentile. And um, so as you go across, these red scores say not so good. But what's interesting is we, she took the second test only two hours later after she took the protocol. And you'll notice the red to green transactions or transitions in there. And what I speculate is basically going through the protocol enabled her created blood flow circumstances such that parts of her brain that weren't working in this in these tests actually flipped back on immediately and they started working and anyway we tested this four years later and she was still green across the bottom meaning that the parts of the brain that switched back on during her workout literally stayed on anyway so that was a, a real wake-up call for us in terms of helping people or feeling like no we really need to get on and push forward with this adaptive contrast stuff Okay, here's another case. This uh, young man was 24 years old when they started. This is a three-month time span. Uh, we'll notice here basically he had a number of yellows and reds, um, but over a period of literally three to four workouts, he went from, you know, yellow, orange to, quite frankly, or pretty much all green, um, and he still reports that he's in good shape you know, I guess six, seven years later. So anyway, the point would be, again, whenever you have a concussion or a bruise to the brain, uh, creating these blood flow you know, situation or the blood flow circumstances that enable these parts of the brain that may have had compromised blood flow to really get oxygenated can make a huge difference over time and in recovery. So talking about equipment, you know, we used this particular, all of these examples were with LIVO2 adaptive contrast, which has a hypoxic max of about 16% or a simulated altitude of about 11,000 feet. Um, LIVO2 AC is good. Okay, but then um, our experiences helped us realize that we probably would have better results if we could increase the hypoxic max. So we created LIVO2 Extreme, which will actually go down to 8%, which makes it easier to establish this four times blood flow through the brain. Um, and so we've discovered that the extreme version is uh, more ideal, mostly because you don't have to work quite as physically hard to get, establish that brain blood flow circuit. Um, we've had LIVO2 standard, which is oxygen only. Uh, it has no hypoxic capability. And what we've learned is that adaptive contrast is absolutely required if you want to access this, this brain function. Um, so standard doesn't work for that, which is why in our marketing and so forth, we really insist that or you know guide people to the adaptive contrast functionality for which we've got patent number 9833643, which is a, was issued and it's a compelling differentiator in the LIVO2 field. So AC is good, extreme is ideal. So the contrast function, you know, between hypoxic and hyperoxic ended up being a profound discovery in terms of the ability to maximize oxygen concentration and blood flow throughout the body. So, you know, in this example or experiment, we show that we maximize the oxygen to the brain and can affect a durable change in the amount of energy the brain is able to produce. Uh, this is actually true throughout the body, uh, liver, kidneys, organs. So anybody that's got a healing requirement will <laughs> obviously benefit by this. So principle, the hypoxia enables you to quadruple approximately the blood flow through the critical circuits, including the brain, and then the switch from hypoxic to hyperoxic uh, creates a increase in of about 600% as documented by Arden in the blood plasma. By the way, uh, if you're watching hemoglobin, you can't see this. So this is not hemoglobin. This is oxygen dissolved in the water or plasma, which in this case can reach uh, roughly at least six times normal. And so if you take the multiple of four times more blood with six times more oxygen, we're basically creating a burst of 20, up to 24 times more oxygen than 
normal in the non-hemoglobin part of the blood, which is if you think about these recovery stories, you know, where people have, wow, I've recovered from my loss of brain function as a result of my injury, it, you know, okay, 24 times more oxygen just might break through the reasons why their brain's not working as well as it should. So anyway, this has uh, been certainly life-changing for many, many LIVO2 users, probably thousands. Um, the other thing is from a performance perspective, we've got uh, corroborating data coming in from other sources. Uh, in this example, we're showing a 29% increase in the amount of oxygen used by the brain, which is uh, generally correlates to a substantial, at least 20% improvement in performance on all sorts of athletic and cognitive performance tests. Um, in my case, just showing a neuro, neurotypical example, and for TBI, sort of concussion kinds of things, we see dramatic in reductions in um, recovery time. Uh, if the injury appears to be a bruise on the brain, sometimes those recoveries, the restoration of uh, um, brain function appear to be immediate. From a CEO's perspective or management perspective, uh, this uh, training technique radically improves your stress tolerance to the extent that's important to you. Um, and it's also important to realize that it's really, really easy to reproduce these results because you can measure them with any neurological test.